Good morning. Uh, my name is Olga Luchikova Schwartz, and um, uh, it's my pleasure to announce uh, a webinar uh, for the Society for the Phenomenology of uh, Religious Experience. Today we have a uh, lecture by uh, Peter Castella, who teaches uh, philosophy at the Providence College in Vermont, and Peter will be commenting on uh, chapter five of uh, Cartesian Meditations. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Olga, for the invitation, and thank you to the Society for inviting me. Uh, thank you also to the reading group who's been studying the Cartesian Meditations, for all of your attendance. I'm, I'm deeply honored. I also, before I get started, just wanted to let you know, sometimes speakers come and they, they simply read their old work. Uh, this is this is new. I wrote this for you all and as I reread the meditations myself. So in, some of this may be a sort of repetition from my book, Layers in uh, Husserl's Work, but mostly it's a new appreciation of mine for the way in which Husserl develops the sphere of ownness throughout the fifth meditation. So I've learned something from doing this with you, namely that um, ownness really does develop across the fifth meditation. And I'll, I'll get there. Um, with you. What I'd like to do is, is read through the paper and take questions at the end of each section. So I'll let you know which section that we're on. And when it's over, I'll ask if you have questions and I'll try to address them as we go. It could be close to the entire time of two hours if there are questions and back and forth discussions at the end of each section. The title of the paper is From Other People to the World to Other People Again, or to paraphrase J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit, There and Back Again. Can everyone hear me okay? Am I coming through clearly? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if any of you can see this. Uh, this is a book by... Muriel Barbary called The Elegance of the Hedgehog. She's a philosopher in France, and it's a book about philosophy, really, and two main characters. I'm gonna start with talking about this book, and I recommend reading it in your spare time if you get a chance. So Muriel Barbary is a French philosopher who's also a novelist. In her interesting novel, The Elegance of the Hedgehog, one of the two main characters, an older woman who is a concierge of an apartment building, uh, speaks about Husserl's Cartesian Meditations, and I'm going to quote from that book. Cartesian Meditations, Introduction to Phenomenology. It quickly becomes clear it is not possible to read Husserl if one has not already read Descartes and Kant, and yet one discovers with equal alacrity that even a solid mastery of Descartes and Kant will not, for all that, open the doors to transcendental phenomenology. I think the concierge is right. Husserl's discussion of the ego and consciousness is not very much like that of Descartes and Kant, even though Husserl keeps some of the terminology and structure of their thinking. The fact that the Meditations is named in honor of Descartes' own work is misleading. There is no parallel ground, no metaphysical gotcha moment akin to the realization in Descartes that the idea of the infinite in me necessitates the existence of an infinite God outside of me. And the fact that Husserl names the transcendental ego as the center of phenomenology does not for all that promote a kind of Kantian idealism in which we probe the filter of consciousness as the limit of what we can know. There are no antinomies or categories in Husserl's work that attempt to delimit the a priori in advance of experience. Rather, what makes Husserl hard to read for the concierge and for us, I think, is that for Husserl, everything a priori we discover about consciousness is itself able to be experienced. The transcendental is our own. It is part of what makes us this experiencer. And as able to be experienced, the transcendental is visible as the very motion of embodiment. This is a big claim I'm making here. Like the, and I, Husserl does make it, right? That the transcendental is able to be experienced. Thus, for Husserl, consciousness is not abstract or cut off from experience. Rather, consciousness is experience, and as such is always outside of itself, ecstatic in the object or the other person. So while I have a lot of sympathy for the concierge in Barbary's novel, she gets it wrong when she says this. 
According to Husserl's theory, and this is the concierge, all that exists is the perception of the cat. And the cat itself, well, we can just do without it. Who needs a cat? What cat? Henceforth, philosophy will claim the right to wallow exclusively in the wickedness of pure mind. The world is an inaccessible reality, and any effort to try to know it is futile. What do we know of the world? Nothing. As all knowledge is merely reflective consciousness exploring its own self, the world, therefore, can merely go to the devil. And then she says, But enough of phenomenology. It is nothing more than the solitary, endless monologue of consciousness, a hardcore autism that no real cat would ever importune. I think it's such a pity this woman got Husserl so wrong, and it may also be the author that got him wrong. But she is in a unique position to get him right. As a concierge, she is the very role of hospitality, the one person who lives as anticipating, recognizing, and ministering to the needs and persons of the people in the building. Her role is to experience the other as other, and thus she might be able to see phenomenology as the hospitality that it is, particularly in Husserl, and even more particularly in the fifth meditation. Contrary to her description, then, what I hope to show is that in the fifth Cartesian meditation, Husserl not only describes the encounter with the other so as to take account of the existence of her cat, but also shows how the existence of the world itself opens out to us from the very experience of the other as alien. For Husserl, in other words, at least the Husserl of the Cartesian meditations, phenomenology is not autism, but rather engagement, a writing of the ship away from the under, ungrounded and metaphysical claims of Descartes and Kant, who both begin, I would say, in autism. For a phenomenologist can always, as Derrida relates in The Animal I Therefore Am, experience our unease in being naked before a gazing cat. So that's the introduction. Anyone have any questions arising from that before we go on to sections 42 and 43 of the Fifth Meditation? I'll just say that um, I read that book some years ago, enjoyed it very much. I recommend it as you do, but uh, Renee, the uh, concierge, um, she's a hedgehog. In other words, she's burrowed and she's not revealing herself and hides her intellectual um, breadth as a matter of principle. Um, and in that sense, it is a little autistic. <laughs> so maybe that's where she's coming from. It's a good book, though. She, that's a very good point about her hiding. That's very good. Uh, Peter, um, a question. Uh, would you uh, speak, please, if, uh, if it's okay to ask uh, a little bit about the history of transcendental pro uh, problem? Because it's Descartes and Kant, uh, but uh, uh, so h how is it developed? Like, where does Husserl take off in his analysis? I mean, what is new about him, or what? How does he draw the, the yeah, line? Yeah, what was the stage of affairs, the knowledge by the time when he started his research, the knowledge of this mental problem, the, the platform, if there is such a platform commonly shared in philosophy uh, at the time of Husserl with regard to uh, the, the transcendental problematic. I'm not sure about the answer to that. My, my, to go back to Bill's point, I've been sort of a hedgehog myself with respect to transcendental phenomenology and uh, Merleau-Ponty as sort of the natural outgrowth of Husserl. So my guess would be that Kant had been left behind in favor of the, the Hegelians, right, who had discovered that whatever consciousness was, it was involved in a progression of contradictions that drove it forward into new shapes. By that project, it seems that the isolation of consciousness from the world was exactly the wrong thing to do as the starting point. It was rather for Hegel to take the engagement of, of consciousness with the world as, as the problem. Um, so it would seem to me that Hegel leaves Kant behind in favor of sort of a natural unfolding of phenomena. However, 
I think there were neo-Kantians and neo-Hegelians that might have been fighting it out. I'm not sure. But what I, what I do think is that Husserl's return to transcendental concepts in any way was looked upon as a, a retro sort of move. It, it didn't seem to people, I would bet, as, um, as a legitimate task anymore because it had already been overcome. And so he himself demands, both in the Cartesian meditations and in the, the volumes of the ideas, that people understand that his notion of the transcendental is not Kant's and that his project is not metaphysical. It's not a hope to prove something, but rather a, a, a hope to be able to engage in a new science of description that attends to the things themselves. This is, I think, where he really separates himself from Kant. It is to the things themselves that he wants to move. Whereas for Kant, the noumena would simply be isolated and we can't speak about it. Any other initial questions? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. So I'll start the next section. This will be sections 42 and 43 of the Cartesian Meditations, the fifth meditation in particular. So let's go through it slowly, noting the following main points for this section. First, the very undoing of the concierge's objection about solipsism from within, and second, the discovery of consciousness as embodied and thus as already pregnant with the world. So it may have more in common with Hegel than in Kant. In section 42, Husserl acknowledges that the, and this is page 89, quote, transcendental reduction restricts me to the stream of my pure conscious processes and the unities constituted by their actualities and potentialities. Indeed, it seems obvious that such unities are inseparable from my ego and therefore belong to its concreteness itself. In saying this, Husserl appears to admit that even intentionality is not enough to prevent objects, let alone alien other people, from being turned into activities of consciousness. If consciousness is pure and focuses on its own acts, it seems objects have no weight or resistance of their own and are just part of the concreteness of consciousness. But if we read his sentence this way, we've misunderstood what pure, constituted, inseparable, and belong mean. To perform the transcendental reduction is not willfully to close one's eyes to the ways objects resist our projects. It is not to assert control where there is only the possibility of answering to the object's demands. I think there's another interpretation. The purity of consciousness achieved by the transcendental reduction is not an abstraction from, but a deferral of the significance of the object on its own terms. It is a deferral by way of focusing on the efforts consciousness puts forth to quote unquote constitute the object. Constitution for Husserl is not a process of creation. It's not our categories, like for Kant, working a priori to shape the phenomenon independently of the noumenon. Rather, constitution is the process whereby we change and adapt what we are to better recognize what the object is. Constitution is therefore something I would translate as recognition. The purity of consciousness is the momentary suspension of the object on its own terms in order to see how we move in that moment to meet it. It is to go back to Ideas One, that was one of the more famous books that he wrote earlier on. The recognition of the way our kinestheses, our movements, are paired with the profiles or the abshadagan of the table such that the noema and the noesis require a back and forth that is only given together because consciousness is never simply on this side of the object, but always engaged with the object in a process that is larger than both of them. Hence, Husserl discusses how pure consciousness is concrete. It, consciousness, is oriented as both actual and potential acts toward the object and recognizes it, gives meaning within consciousness's own system. But that system of acts and awareness grows too. It gets oriented by the object. The belonging and inseparability of the object of consciousness, this is the very push of intentionality toward the redefinition of consciousness. We are not masters of things. 
Rather, we are the matter of things insofar as things matter to us. In section 43, Husserl anticipates the description of the other person by means of what he calls a transcendental clue. I find the other, he says, as objects in the world, yet also at the same time as subjects for this world. So I'm in the world, but because I'm aware, I have the world in me. This apparent enigma is something that has not appeared, I don't think, within the meditations to this point. We should be puzzled that it hasn't. For do we not also find ourselves as both objects in and subjects for the world? Indeed, Husserl will return to this sort of description in the crisis in section 28, where he will try to articulate the problem of consciousness as an object in and a subject for what he calls the life world. It is in light of the other person here in the fifth meditation, then, that we come home to the fact that, quote, I experience the world, including others and that that experience marks itself as both shared and perspectival. Here, Husserl thinks that the objection of solipsism is really no objection at all. I already experience the other as other, and the world itself I experience not only as shared, but also as turned away toward the other person. So experience already disproves solipsism. And yet we must experience this undoing of solipsism ourselves, we must come to see how the other person is alien to us as another consciousness, which bears the whole world in herself from over there, is in fact the ground of all having of an object. The transcendental reduction, in other words, that gives to us our own purity can be this way only because the others who see the sides of the table that I do not yet see are implicated in my having of the table from here. The others are embedded in the profiles that are given to me in advance and are the possibility of my very concreteness. If we go back to the concierge, the pure transcendental ego begins as something autistic, but it becomes in the fifth meditation something thoroughly engaged. And all we need to do is to see how the other person requires of us a certain kind of activity, a certain kind of breaking open, such that the belonging and inseparability of the object within our consciousness can be understood not as an achievement or a mastery, but as a promise or a deferral that is nevertheless, nonetheless real. In other words, the point of the fifth meditation, I think, is to prove how we have a world because we have others, and because our pure consciousness is never simply our own, but rather a shared act. The world is ours, because it is yours and mine and hers. We have the world, in other words, because we never fully have the world, and because our not having full recognition of others matters to us. We have a world because our possibility is by definition never fully reduced to actuality or activity. This might be useful to a certain reading of the creation story in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve lived in the garden But it's not clear that they lived in the world until they ate of the tree. Even that seems not to be enough. Rather, it's the shame they felt in the presence of the gaze of God, in the hiding and the conflict with the other, with God, that caused them to have to recognize the world and to dwell within it. Without the conflict with the ultimate other, with God, it is not clear to me that Adam and Eve would have seen each other as other. Remember, one is made from the bones of the other. It is not clear to me that they would have been able to perceive the world as such. Simultaneous with their experience of God as the other, however, is the experience of their own bodies as a whole, something that the global feeling of shame talks about, and an immersion in world experience and suffering, which I take to be the passive and active synthesis of a world that is always theirs from that point on. So that's the end of the first section on 42 and 43. Are there any questions on those two sections? Well, I have a a question. Um, And it's one I've been asking for uh, quite some time, actually, weeks at least. How can I say this? So um, uh, I've read much of um, your book, Layers, and I've read most of your essay. 
and uh, I read others. And we, we always um, we spend a lot of time talking about intersubjectivity and the other subject. And so what it seems to me in my thinking about this, just on my own, is that what we don't spend enough time doing is talking about other um, itself. And what I mean is other objects, the very fact that there's other than me. And it's because, you know, just like, you know, a child recognizes a toy or whatever, there's the introduction of other, um, which seems to me revolutionary. But because um, we haven't spent a lot of time doing this, it seems to me that, I mean, the claim that you make and um, I think Husserl makes is that this other subject is already there, hidden in all our um, understandings of the world of, and of all perceptions and things like that. And so, um, but so I think um, I fail at least to be entirely persuaded by that because we haven't spent enough time talking about the other, meaning not necessarily other subjects, but other itself. Um, and so seeing that, for example, in my looking outside, I can see a tree and I know that tree is other, but I don't see it as a subject other. The others might see a tree as a subjective other. Um, and that and that revolution, um, we haven't spent enough time talking about that constitution for me to see how this tree, even this tree outside that I see as other, is somehow rather bound up and entailed in the other subjects that of, of intersubjectivity. I remember this uh, question of yours, even from the, the reading groups posted discussion, and I thought it was a good one at the time, and I, I, I think you've expressed it very well now. And so it might be that you are viewing other as a concept as opposed to an existential experience. In other words, um, the tree outside your window seems to give you the, the thought or the concept, not me. And how is it that that tree can give you that concept when there is no other person standing next to the tree, jumping up and down and pointing to it and saying, see, here's what I'm helping you to see, right? So, so in some sense, there's, is, is other a concept? And then does the other person serve as a concept in difference of degree or kind or something like that? If, if I understand what you're saying, I don't think other is a concept. I think it's something that we live out. And what's noteworthy for me is that the object always retains its sense its meaning of transcending me. The tree is less sophisticated than you are or than I am. Any other object than another thinking, perceiving being will maintain less transcendence, I think Husserl would want to say, than our own consciousness. It's not even clear that the world on its own could ever maintain itself as having a transcendence more than ours since, to go back to that point about the enigma, we have within our consciousness the sense of the world. So for the thing to maintain a sense of outside of consciousness as such is noteworthy. It would seem impossible for it to do so if it were really left alone with its own characteristics only. The other person, I would say, is what Husserl is, is trying to say, the other person guarantees that the, the thing, the tree or the glass or the table appears as other by virtue of their being bound up with it, with us. So there is no explanation for how an object other than a person could present itself as in any way removed or removable from consciousness without the guarantee of the complete doubling of our consciousness over there in the other person. So I know you've read the book and I know you've read Husserl. And so 
in some sense, I'm just repeating the argument back. But I think if I understand, Bill, what you're saying, you're saying, and I could be wrong, and you tell me, you, you're saying the things present themselves on their own. And why can't we figure out what makes them other before we figure out what the participation of other people or other consciousness is? And I think what Husserl is saying is things do not present themselves on their own, um, at least not in any way that would maintain them as interesting objects of our perception. So I'd like to give you some time to respond because maybe I haven't understood or haven't answered in any way that's helpful. Well, your response, of course, is helpful. Um, so fundamentally, the way I see, the way I see, all right, it's, it's essentially, essentially like what Boswell's comment about Johnson, and I've mentioned this before, is when you kick the other, it kicks back. And so that, in my, my, my mind, is a fundamental and foundational experience. And, and that's how we know the other is by this, in fact, we even use this word resistance. There is a resistance to, of the other, and that's how we know it's not ours. And, and the very fact of its resistance, in my mind, does present it as um, something that is beyond us, that is other, not just other than us, it's not just a concept. It's, I mean, Holga, Holga hates it when I use this word, but I think it's ontological. It's ontologically founding our world, these other things that we encounter from very small ages. And, um, and as I've said before, I think, I think it's actually easier, as children do, they anthropomorphize, whatever that word is, everything. And I think that's the natural thing to do. So actually, I think it's more difficult to understand how a thing it becomes constituted than the other doll or the other tree. I mean, people, of course, we know generations and, and peoples have thought of trees as very much like us and rivers and streams. So I think that's actually quite natural. <laughs> and I think that's easy to do. It's harder to do what we do today is think them as things. Anyway, I'm, I'm not making myself clear. And, and I know this is going to be a long, this is, this is a process, trying to understand not just what Husserl is saying, because it's actually less important to me what Husserl is trying to say is to understand what I think is actually the case. Um, uh, I'm not intending to ever become a Husserl scholar. <laughs> um, but I do um, like the whole process of trying to get beneath, which is next to impossible to get beneath, um, trying to get to where we, the world isn't, or isn't already for us. That's all I'll say. But anyway, thanks for trying. I'll, I'll keep trying to address your concerns as we go on. But you, I do have you in mind from the time I saw you write out that question until now. I don't know that I'll be very helpful, but I, I am trying to process it. Okay, I have a very simple question regarding one small thread uh, of this Eve and Adam thing. So, uh, are you, is, do you, does, would Hasse imply? That it was necessary to eat this apple, right? So, so we, uh, it was necessary. Uh, they had to do it because otherwise, I don't know, there wouldn't be work. And this actually connects with another topic from the beginning of your talk. There was a cat mentioned, a famous cat, and that it uh, brought to mind a Schrodinger's cat. I think Bill Powers would have more to, to say on this special cat. But, um, would Hassel say that, okay, we have to open the box and see the cat that is dead because uh, otherwise there's no cat? So that was uh, my question. Um, so I, I understand, I think, the question about uh, Adam and Eve better than I understand the cat. Now, I haven't read the Schrodinger thing very carefully, so I don't know. But I will say this. I think there is scriptural and tradition-based um, ways in which to say, yes, you're correct. So in Christianity, as far as I understand it, Adam and Eve's sin is Felix culpa, which is happy fault. And I think um, that's a way of saying their original sin makes sense and is generative by means of grace for the entirety of Jewish and Christian experience. Um, and it, in a sense, brings God forward into human life. 
So that, that's how I see, you know, the position of Jesus as taking up the Felix culpa of Adam and Eve. So yes, in a certain sense, I don't know if Husserl would read Genesis this way, but I think I do in Husserlian vein. Yes, I think in some sense, eating the apple was necessary for them to gain self-consciousness and to gain the world. Um, and so, yes, I think that that is absolutely true. And I think this pairs into some extent with Bill because there is no recognition of the garden or of the apple or of themselves before there is a there is a kind of encounter with God. There and there can be no encounter that is not also a redefinition of the body of the whole body. Um, that may be why children do not learn object permanence until they see that they are seen by the adults as a whole and can navigate their experience of their body, which is mostly partial, with the whole experience the adult has. Merleau-Ponty gives an example that other psychologists have used in the phenomenology of perception of the infant of about six months or so who's laying down on the floor and has a mirror in front of her or him. And the father or mother comes up from behind and their reflection is in the mirror that the infant is looking at. And the infant immediately turns around because somehow that six month old connects the image in the mirror with the parent behind them. But what they don't connect at that same age is the image in the mirror of themselves with the body that they actually are. So they have the image and, and existence of the parent in the mirror before they get their own image in the mirror. And I think that's because they don't yet connect the view that the parent has to their whole body with their own view of that same body in the mirror. They don't connect the parent's envisioning of the whole infant with that image. Um, but they themselves have the image of the parent as a whole in their experience, and they can connect themselves, the parent, with the image. And so I think for Husserl, it's not until we have the whole body of our own in our grasp that we can differentiate any object or any other um, successfully. So that, that's me trying to weave together a response to two people. And I don't know what to do with the cat, I'm sorry. That was a beautiful, beautiful explanation, but the cat, I mean, we can leave it for, for later for Bill Power sometimes to, to, to make a Husserl interpretation of, of, of Schrodinger's cat. So, okay. so it's not necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Peter, I have a question. Um, so for the child, like uh, you described um, this example, is there a bodily transfer already or not yet? I think there is some transfer insofar as um, the reason that the infant turns around is that the infant understands the, herself or the mirror to be looked at by the parent. So there is some participation in sort of co-looking at something, but there isn't a full awareness of the transference until the infant realizes that she is seen as a whole, the way that she's okay. in front of her. So there's a partial transference. I think what may not come through in my writing and what may not come through in Husserl is that these insights that he's, he's talking about, we have to be open to, we have to allow to happen. And once we drop the restriction to the sphere of ownness, once we're ready to experience the alterity of the other, then all of these things can become clearer or situated for us. But if we demand to ourselves, and if we are not open, you know, in either way, like, you know, if the Nazis are saying the Jews are not my other, or even Levinas, a Jewish phenomenologist, says the Palestinian is not my other, right? What we're saying is I'm not open. So if I'm not open, then, then all of these descriptive patterns don't work on us. But we can also think about not being open genetically. So something that Bill is right about I think he's studying sort of the genetic understanding of, of otherness. And genetically, we're not, we're not prepared until other people have caressed our whole body as an infant, 
Like we're not, we're not yet aware of what our whole body would mean in explicit ways. And that prevents our immersion into the world, prevents object permanence, things like that. That would be how I would answer. Mm -hmm. Another question using the, in reference to Bill Powers, uh, incorrect, new to my use of the word ontological. Uh, I like it very much, uh, but uh, in that context, um, uh, what do you mean by noumenon uh, in this context? Uh, well, well, for Kant, the noumenon would be the object independent of consciousness. In thing in itself? Yes. Okay. But the noema and the noesis is Husserl's revision of that, right? Mm -hmm. so, so Husserl is going back to the Greek against Kant to say there is only an interplay between object and consciousness. Right? Mm -hmm. So... And that makes the mystery of the object's continued transcendence of us even more explicit, right? <laughs> if, if my activity of perceiving or thinking is tied so intimately to the object that we both, both basically deserve the same grammatical structure, right? A noetic act, I turn to see something from a different side, and a noematic profile, the table, if I look underneath it, will give me a different sense of itself. If those are tied together as grammatically dual, right, then that means that consciousness itself is not separated from otherness, but embeds otherness within itself. But if that's true, then how does the object maintain any sense of transcendence or alterity? And it's from that question that I think Husserl moves to the other person to show how if otherness is something we have access to, it can only remain other because we ourselves have a kind of relationship with alterity as such that we are embedded in while remaining ourselves. So. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. This is Bill Adams. Um, uh, back to Bill Powers' comment, too, and your immediate comment. Um, I am uncomfortable with the idea that the definition of alterity depends on embodiment. Um, I think it, an alternative point of view is that it depends on what Husserl is calling um, something like my ownness, my, my fundamental reduced sense of ownness, what I would call ipseity, or the sense of self, not, not as conceptualized and articulated, but the sense of I am the one receiving the input and, and the author of my agency. The infant in the mirror may not be responding on the basis of embodiment, but on the basis of a social construct that's learned uh, even before birth, that we start out as we nests and the, um, because, you know, even as an adult, I can't say that I have complete understanding of my body or what it does or why it does things. And so the idea that I must be in possession of my whole body before I can appreciate otherness. That that just doesn't sound right to me. Anybody who's tried to do anything athletic like baseball or golf, you know how hard it is to make your body do things. So I think Husserl, what bothers me about Husserl's logic here is the leap to intersubjectivity based on the fact of embodiment. Um, I, I think it's more convincing to go with a social leap rather than this um, embodied leap. And, and Bill, uh, Bill Powers asks, you know, what, what is it that is not me? I mean, I think another way to ask what is that other thing is to say what is not me. And so to answer that, you have to say, what is me? Who am I? And even the infant has a sense of not being the mother. Uh, this is really deep in psychoanalysis, but there is a separation from the other. At the same time, there's a unity with the other. But that's all very social. That's, that's not about the body. So there's my objection to the emphasis on embodiment. I think that's a good 
uh, objection, and I, it does lead into the next section. So if I, I'll give you a very quick um, answer based on what I think the next section will hold, and then I should probably continue with it because I noticed that we're already almost an hour through and I have three hours left to do. To do. Um, but I think it's a great question. I, I will notice, I'll, I'll note two things. First of all, um, you're right. The infant has some notion of her or his body as a whole. We are always given to ourselves as a whole. So it, it would be wrong of me to suggest, and I know that I did suggest this, that you know people don't have in any way a grasp of their body as a whole. They certainly do, because anytime we touch them on any part of their body, if it's a painful or pleasurable thing, they are going to recognize it as painful or pleasurable, and it's because we are touching them there at any point on their bodies. So you're right. I think your point about ownness and wanting it to be a social or a conceptual move, the first thing that Husserl notices in ownness is the way the body works. So at least I feel comfortable textually in terms of Husserl, ownness isn't conceptual. It is almost immediately bodily. Um, there's more to say in response to you. Again, I think your, your points are very, very good, but I would like to continue if that's all right with the, the second section. Um, so this is sections 44 to 48. Before Husserl begins what he calls the reduction to the sphere of ownness, which I maintain is a thought experiment meant only to slow down the experience of the other, he makes an important caveat. He says on page 94, that the way the experience of the other works is that, quote, there becomes constituted for me the new existence sense, and it's new, that goes beyond my monadic very ownness. This should tell us something. We experience, even within the overarching transcendental reduction, the existence of the other person as transcending my own existence. This sense will mean that the existence of the other person does not, indeed cannot, fall under the reduction. There is no suspension of my own existence, nor is there a suspension of the existence of the other person. The other person's existence forces itself upon me by means of its motion within me and its mirroring. So Husserl does talk about mirroring on page 94. The question asked within the reduction to the sphere of ownness then is not whether the other person exists, but how the other person comes to this existence sense for me. And it is the slow motion reply of this experience that Husserl is focused on here. What we find, Husserl says, when we reduce our experience to simply what we have control over, to what refers simply and only to ourselves, is the entangling of consciousness in our lived bodies. We mean to see what consciousness is on its own terms, our own terms, in experience. But what we find is that consciousness is bodily and that this body governs by way of being unable to activate itself all at once. Hence, I think, Bill, your point about how even as an adult, we don't have all of our body in grasp. That's exactly right, and it's true for Husserl throughout. This is a big point. Let's take up a sentence or two on page 97. In the middle of 97, Husserl says, quote, as perceptively active, I experience or can experience all of nature, including my own animate organism, which therefore in the process is reflexively related to itself. That becomes possible because I can perceive one hand by means of the other, an eye by means of a hand, and so forth, a procedure in which the functioning organ must become an object and the object a functioning organ. As pure consciousness then, when I restrict myself to my own pure sphere, I am bodily and experience the whole world, all of nature. But because I experience the whole, I am thereby able to experience myself. Something about the all of nature requires that I experience all of myself, but I cannot, at least not fully or adequately. I can touch one hand at a time, but I cannot, except perhaps a bit mutely in the perception of clasping my hands together, feel both of them as objects and subjects at the same time. I can either see out of my eye or touch it, but I cannot do both. And I think most of us here are going through aging. And so we rediscover things about our body all the time. At least I do. Um, thus, the process of experiencing all is the enabling of my self-experience as an unfolding genetic process. 
We can think of a baby learning of her hands and feet and feeling absorbed, at least to us, in touching or sucking them. I grow to understand my body even at eight or nine years old as having perceptions I was unaware of until I learned about death or sickness. There is a genetic process to this description, in other words, that Husserl presents here, but there is thereby a series of limitations. To get the whole of myself in my grasp is always partial and requires that I obey a powerful command. To touch my hand is for it to have to turn into an object and then back to an organ. I do not get to choose that or how or even always when this happens. For my body as consciousness is so wrapped up in the requirement of the process in ownness that I realize that the distinction between object and lived body or Körper and Leib in German is something I cannot get rid of. I am that distinction. Bill Powers, you, this is where I would go further to, to address your question. I am the distinction between object and lived body, Körper and Leib. I enact it forever or for as long as my consciousness is entwined within my body. Just as I am given embodiment as the logic I must obey, I will be given my body as the very logic of the enigma of subjectivity. I am in the world and have the world as my constituted all because I am body. Or to say this another way, the body is the most complicated logic I will ever see because I cannot fully see it. The very objects of my body, hands, eyes, ears, are the way I have the world. But their having of the world requires that I always be capable of grounding their perception in a reduction of their acts under my touch or gaze or mouth, as in the case of the infant sucking her toes or fingers. Is the feel of the rug under my feet mine? It is if I can put my toes in my mouth. If we turn now to section 46, we see that the potentialities of consciousness that we get are, we get them from the motor of embodiment. It is because I cannot be everywhere at once in my experience that possibility, and I would argue time, figure into my description of experience. As Husserl says at the top of page 102, my own too is discovered by explication and gets its original sense by virtue thereof. So the reduction of the sphere of onus doesn't happen all at once, just like my sense of my whole body never happens all at once. Right? To be pure consciousness is not to be absolved of work. I work on what is mine because it unfolds in experience as the motion of my consciousness from all of nature to all of embodiment to a part of nature to a part of me and back again. Thus, we see in our ownness that we have delimited or reduced ourselves to that Temporality demands our attention. Indeed, one might say with Husserl in the crisis that being an embodied ego is not the only way of being an ego. And I think both bills are getting at that. And surely that's right. But in this case, in the sphere of onness, we see that embodiment requires a process of attention, of explication, and thus pushes us to recognize what Husserl calls on page 102, quote, the horizon of being that is included in my essence and thereby my existence in the form of an open infiniteness. Even if we are not phenomenologists then, like the concierge of Barbary's novel proclaims not to be, we are engaged in explication. And that explication moves us from this or that concrete specific bodily motion and embeddedness toward my existence itself. The concierge was really worried about our cat's existence and whether we would ever phenomenologically recognize that. But first, we need to know how to recognize existence as such. And it appears for Husserl that the clue of the body and its motion from itself as a whole to a multiplicity of organs, to those organs as objects, points toward the experience of existence as such. Our existence is an open infiniteness that we can only explicate part of, the part here in the living present, this organ or that one, adequately. Existence, then, for ourselves is the experience of my being engaged as a body in a process of explication that is openly infinite. Existence is openness. Body is, too. Body is openness toward the requirement that being a whole body means bearing that wholeness in each organ, in each area of my touch field. 
having clarified the sense that existence has for me of my ownness as bodily time, as the open infiniteness, <coughs> excuse me, of explication enforced upon me by the process of experience, we can now turn to how Husserl reinforces that consciousness is not autistic, even in the sphere of ownness. If we turn to section 47 on page 104, we read toward the bottom that ownness gives us, quote, a nature, including inanimate organism, that is constituted to be sure as a unity of spatial objects transcending the stream of subjective processes, yet constituted as merely a multiplicity of objects of possible experience. This experience being purely my own life, and what is experienced in this experience being nothing more than a synthetic unity inseparable from this life and its potentialities. This quote at first blush seems to contradict what I'm saying, namely that even in ownness, the concierge is wrong to label phenomenology as autistic. In other words, it looks pretty autistic. But let us look closer. The way in which objects and all of nature, the world, insofar as I can perceive it alone, transcend me in my experience of them is not total. If it were, I would not perceive them. If they simply transcended me without being within me, experience would never happen. The objects, all of nature, would be just too alien. Transcendence, then, is an experience because my body holds within it the promise of coming to know all of these things better, because consciousness is always of the object and of nature as a whole, which can be explicated in open infiniteness. The words merely and nothing more, in other words, are Husserl's way of saying that we are always already secure in our experience. We know that, as Roy Rogers said, strangers are friends we haven't met yet. Why do we know this? Because we live a life, a life that is in some sense independent of us while we claim it as ours, a life that is by definition a temporality, an open indefiniteness that can grasp itself, can grasp its horizons as, in fact, open infiniteness. We have the world and objects as inseparable from this life because this life opens onto time as such and onto explication as such. We are this body, condemned to live fully in one sense or one organ at a time because we are also embodiment as a whole, time as a whole, explication as a whole. In other words, in onus, we have a security that objects and world are in us, in our consciousness, because we feel ourselves promised to their transcendencies from within. We are meant for objects. We turn our hands into them. And they are nothing more than the possibility we have of remaining promised to them. But perhaps this security disappears in the light of the alien other person, the other with a capital O. In a sense, it does, but in a sense, it doesn't. What we will see following section 48 is the way in which, as Bill wondered about in a recent email to the Sofury group, the alien other person is the inherently first object. It is not, therefore, that the other person explodes what we might call our ontological security with respect to the transcendence of objects. Rather, the other person makes the security of ownness possible. For the moment, though, let us turn to section 48. There on page 105, we see two important claims that Husserl is making. First, Husserl is saying that the experience of the other person is a contrast of my own essence. It is a conflict, in other words, at an essential level. That we have an experience of the other, Husserl does not doubt. But he does say that this experience, quote, presupposes that not all my own modes of consciousness are modes of my self-consciousness. That's the first point. The second is that Husserl asks how it could be that, quote, the ego has and can always go on forming in himself such intentionalities of a different kind, intentionalities with an existence sense whereby he wholly transcends his own being. Let's look at each in turn. First, Husserl is claiming here that I can be conscious without being self-conscious. This might mean, for example, that what I am conscious of is both in me and not my own doing, such as when I can see in your face that you are bored with this talk and tired of my voice. I don't really want that to happen, but I can see it anyway. 
In such an experience, you inhabit my consciousness, perhaps without my being aware of my own processes. That is what has caused you to feel bored and tired. That's not to say that my own feeling of shame or irritation in such an instance would not be a part of the experience. It would, but it might not be, and it would only be a part. It might also mean that we are aware of more than we can name, such as when we discover only much later that we really love someone who has died. This experience is in fact one that did not announce itself to us as our own until the absence of the other person called it forward. In any case, that consciousness does not have to be self-consciousness is an important point. Explication, phenomenology, must be very careful. We need to be, as phenomenologists, attentive to what we mean, because we can always say more or less than what the experience holds. But the second point is perhaps even more interesting. There Husserl talks about how in our consciousness of the other, we are aware of how one of the objects of our consciousness, this person over there, forces us to transcend our own being. Our very having of the experience of the other person makes us ecstatic. We transcend ourselves by means of our experience of her or him. This means something to our experience of any object. Our security in the face of the trees or the tables or the car's transcendence comes because in the face of the alien other, we have transcended ourselves on behalf of what is essentially incompatible with us. We have transcended ourselves in the most radical way possible and yet remained within our consciousness. Thus, an experience of any other object situates itself within that frame. A table means to be outside of us, but it is not outside of us to the extent that the other person is. And we have already taken that trip, gone in a spaceship outside of our own being, and realized when we experience the other person on our spaceship that we have never left the earth of our consciousness. I'm reminded of the character of Max in a children's story called Where the Wild Things Are. If you remember, his mother was mad at him, and Max went on an imaginary journey through monsters and oceans. The banishment to his room, the consciousness of his mother, made him recognize that he was king of all the wild things, but not of his mother. We might also probe the forgiveness of the mother who leaves his meal for him while he is imagining or pouting or whatever he does. The mother hands him the world as a sphere of ownness through her punishment, and then hands him back the world again with her in it through the food. And it is for Max and for us who read it to our children to realize that Max's ownness has been a rehearsal of his anger and guilt. Right, so that's the, the next section. Does anyone have a question on sections 44 to 48? Maybe a, a brief one uh, regarding uh, actually the previous uh, Bill Adams comment on embodiment. I was thinking of um, as I say, I'm not a philosopher, but I was thinking of people who are deaf by uh, from the birth or uh, deaf or, or blind. So with what Hassan says, with that, so they can never uh, be fully human, right? So they can, because their experience is sort of narrowed, so they can never achieve humanity. I don't know, that's uh, the, 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 the strong claim that I, I think could be inferred from what happens to see, which is obviously not true. Uh, so what right. Do you say to that? Right. Um, so Husserl struggles with questions like this a lot, and he talks about normality and abnormality um, in throughout his work and tries to articulate that. But I well, think the, the, uh, the, one question. This is not a question of abnormality. These people, they they even don't think of them as handicapped. They think they are just different. So right. this is not question of framing of normality and no i know that and so so i think husserl's terms for dealing with um people who have different ways of being a body is is ineffective is my point like i don't i don't think he is the most effective at articulating this but i will say this i was pointing out to my students the other day that we, we don't have very many people who are blind on our campus 
But we do have one woman, and she's also of color, which is odd because on our campus, most people are white and Catholic. I believe she's of color, not Catholic, and blind. And I could tell immediately, while well, she is walking around the campus using uh, the stick to na help her navigate, that the space of the campus made absolutely no sense to her. She was continuously surprised by how the walks were, were going. And I pointed out to my students later, I said, I think her experience of space is very different. And the shock that she gets is in noticing that none of this would make sense for anyone who was blind. Like it just, and, and in fact, someone who knew her said, yeah, that's exactly what she says. She says, this, is, this campus is crazy, as the paths make no sense. The reason I'm relating this is because she definitely has a sense of her own body. She definitely has an experience of space as a whole and of her role within it. But what she also experiences is space in a, in a remarkably different way that requires for her to navigate in it a certain way of making sense. And so I think there is definite difference in the way we inhabit our bodies and in the way we experience objects and the world bodily. But whether one is blind or deaf or becomes blind or deaf later in life or loses an arm or multiple arms, the body as a whole surges through whatever organs we have that, that allow us to experience. And that structure doesn't change regardless of what of what and who we are. Now, I think phenomenologically, there's a lot of work that can be done and should be done on all of the different ways of being a body, whether it's gender or sexual orientation or um, blindness, deafness, whatever. Phenomenology is open to that because I think that the basic structure of phenomenology privileges the whole of the body over the parts as a process of unfolding. So anytime there's a privileging of the whole, anything that Husserl might have counted as, as normal or abnormal sort of doesn't carry with it the connotation of um, less than, lacking, or not quite full. At any rate, I think phenomenology is on board with multiplicity of descriptions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, go ahead. I just had one brief thing to say in response to Margot. Um, and, 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 and yours, comments, Peter, and this was. Um, my teacher and my postdoc, um, a perceptionist, taught one great lesson, and the lesson was you don't see with your eyes. You just don't. And so I think that, um, and likewise, any of your senses, the idea that you know the world through the senses, I believe is a old pre 20th century idea that Husserl had based on Aristotle. And I think it lingers with us even today and the future will show that it's wrong um, as we become more Transhuman, in other words, we have we become bionic, if you will. We have more uh, retinal implants and cochlear implants and what have you. You will find that you don't see with your eyes and you don't hear with your ears. And so the emphasis on knowing the world through the senses is, um, I believe, anachronistic, or not anachronistic, it's just outdated. So I wanted to say that somebody who's blind really may not feel or believe themselves to be handicapped in any way because their world is full and complete because you don't see with your eyes. So I accept that Husserl is from another age, but I think he's wrong about that. He may well be, and, and I may be lacking in, in the ability to respond adequately to Margot and to you, although I, I will pick up on one thing that I think you said excellently, which is Anyone has a full world by virtue of being a body. Um, and there are no gaps in that. There may be frustrations, there may be conflicts, but by virtue of being a body, we have a world, I would agree. And, and that's really important, that 
um, forces us to reconsider as prejudice how we have treated people for a very long time. Uh, but anyway, that, that's very good. All right, I'll move on to now to the sections 49 to 51 of the fifth meditation. I think in some sense, this is the most important part for me of the fifth meditation. And it will have, and I will, I will use um, what I think is a pretty cool example that I've come up with. I hope that you like it. And that, that's just to tantalize you into remaining here for another a little while. So, but after that, I have no more cool examples to use. And so then you'll just be here out of uh, hopefully, you know, interest. Um, so Husserl says that the alien other is the first primordial other as such in section 49, page 107. There he shows us that the world becomes the world as objective only because the other person has done her work on us. Quote, accordingly, the intrinsically first other is the other ego. And the other ego makes constitutionally possible a new infinite domain of what is other, small o, in quotes. The experience of the other person then does not make the world real for us in the sense that without her, we would have nothing. She makes the world real for us in the sense that having nothing is never an option while she is with us. We have never simply been alone. As someone has said, we you know, were born connected to, to a mother. We may feel lonely, we may lose family and friends, but we are never not experiencing the contrast or conflict in our essence that the other person provides. And we are never bereft of the conflict that immediately opens had always already opened into an infinite domain. This infinite domain is not completely uncharted waters that leave us terrified and prevent our journey. We are more like Peter, who at a gesture or word from Jesus tries to walk on the sea during a storm. We begin to walk on the stormy water because we know there is a power in the other that harmonizes with ourselves. If the transcendence of objects that are not other egos was not threatening, because we were secure in our experience of them as what we could not yet see or know just yet, the transcendence of other egos are not totally threatening because the infinite domain that they present as our shared world has as its foundation our harmony together. Husserl says this on page 108. Here the shared world has, quote, the ideality of endless openness whose component particular subjects are equipped with mutually corresponding and harmonious constitutive systems. This harmony, Husserl con continues, is not a Leibnizian metaphysical assertion, but is rather, quote, itself part of the explication of the intentional components implicit in the fact of the experiential world that exists for us. The world as an ideal or a whole, then, is given as openly infinite as a concretion of the temporality that each of us lives in her or his life. And this is because, the infinity is because, our conflict between our essence and hers and his is a conflict of musicality, a melody that provides resolution and development. We are given a world that is shared infinitely because we are already certain and secure that our perceptual systems, our meaning-recognizing acts, are intertwined. So, Bill, this may go some way to talk about sociality and perception. Here and there, we may lose our footing, conflict with one another, storm out of the room. But we fundamentally believe in the fact that we are meant for one another by means of this world, a world in whose production we have held some role. Like Peter, we believe. We simply need help in our unbelief. In section 50, Husserl moves to establish how this harmony develops, what it is made of, and how we can recognize or experience it. This is the improvement over Leibniz. We experience the harmony of ourselves with others. On page 109, Husserl asserts that the experience of the other person as other, and thus of the world as shared, occurs because, quote, a certain mediacy of intentionality must be present here, going out from the substratum primordial world and making present the consciousness of there too. We have here accordingly a kind of making co-present a kind of appresentation, end quote. That's page 109. The world then gains an agency. It, the world, sends out immediacy of intentionality, a sense of the other person as perceiving the world and me on her own. 
it goes out from the world such that the world, other, and myself are so thoroughly intertwined that there are no gaps. There is only the corresponding systems that intersect, demand, support, and challenge one another. In other words, to put forward my definition of constitution once again for Husserl, neither the other nor myself constitute in the sense of create the world. The world too has a kind of agency that I experience. The other emanates from the world as though it were not clear at all who is giving this experience to whom. The world is the very togetherness of self and other, and as such has a power over all of us, one that embeds the three of us within one another. Thus, constitution is as much passive as active, as much consciousness as self-consciousness. Indeed, at the bottom of page 110, we see this clearly. Quote, the body over there, which is nevertheless apprehended as an animate organism, must have derived this sense by an apperceptive transfer from my animate organism, and done so in a manner that excludes an actually direct and hence primordial showing of the predicates belonging to an animate organism specifically. This is the first inkling in the fifth meditation that constitution is shared. There is some process happening, this having of a world in common that happens behind our backs. The other person's body has, quote, derived the sense of a living, perceiving body by a transfer. But I did not agree to this transfer. I didn't fill out a form. How did this happen? We do not know, since it is consciousness without self-consciousness, and even without predication. It is pre-predicative. I am reminded of the woman with a hemorrhage who touched Jesus. Many people were around him, and yet he felt power draining from him. So everybody's touched him. Some touch mattered. This woman derived by transfer from him a sense of his power. Jesus felt her touch as meaningful, as grouping himself with her, even without seeing her. But even Jesus seems not to know who or why was the, the touch happening. He asks her, at least, why, when she identifies herself. It is this kind of passivity, that of Jesus suffering her touch, that Husserl means by this transfer. Surely we do not feel as Jesus did the way bodies even far away from ours acquire the same essence as our own from us. We are left with the fact that such a transfer has always already happened. We are left without predicates to explain. And yet there is something of our ownership of our body that has broadened in this transfer. They live their bodies as I do, and not just in a metaphorical way. We own their ownership from within. We are not making an external comparison. The ownership of their own bodies claims us from within. So when I saw the person walking around the campus with her stick, it claimed me because I saw her way of moving in space. Sartre, in Being in Nothingness, speaks of standing at a keyhole and peeking into a room, presumably to see someone cheating on him. He hears the stairs creak behind him and feels the entire world drain away. That's what he says. He can no longer see into the keyhole, though he keeps, keeps the same position of his head. It's only the stairs that creak. And yet the world announces to him that his world is shared, that there has been a draining away, a transfer of his own essential role as consciousness, not just into the other person, but into the stairs, the walls, etc. As Husserl says in section 50, this experience, this apperception is not a thinking act. It is not an analogy, as if we said, oh, she has arms. I have arms, therefore we're together. Nothing like an analogy or an utterance processes my experience of her. Rather, my experience of her is immediate in its occurrence and infinite in its reverberations. Husserl then makes a very interesting example about how this transfer is not the only one of its kind. All apperception or co-perception, he says, involves transfer. And this is on page 111. Quote, to the extent that there is given this beforehand, there is such a transfer. The child who already sees physical things understands, let us say, for the first time, the final sense of scissors. And from now on, he sees scissors at first glance as scissors. I would like to spend some time with the scissors example in order to sketch out the coming sections, particularly 51, in which pairing occurs. So now I have this really cool concrete example that I'm going to show you. It's really exciting of scissors, right? Let's look at a pair of scissors. What do we first notice? First, that we call this a pair, like we have a pair of shoes uh, or a pair of pants or a pair of trees. Why do we do this? Because the blades are not entirely separate. 
and because they refer to one another. The scissors are two blades attached here at the top. The blades overlay one another, and there is a small gap between them as they move across one another. The gap is precisely what allows the paper or other material to fit between them and to be cut. The blades also refer to one another. They slide over and overlay one another, like humans in an erotic position. But they also internally point, intentionally point to one another. How are they given together when they literally need to be attached to one another with a pin? They are given together, I would think, by means of the loops through which our fingers enter. The blades refer to one another, and the child can learn what the final sense of scissors are because the blades are meant for the fingers of one and the same hand. The hoops are for the fingers to engage one another, for the experience of cutting as a whole. The loops are for the fingers to participate in an action together as the blades do. The very life of the blades is the fingers. And because the fingers are part of the same organ and the same touch field, the blades are reinforced and given together forever as a pair that is meant to work as we do and that works with us. The pairing of the blades then depends on the pairing of the fingers and even more on the pairing that the human does with other humans. There is something in the gap between the blades and between us that enacts the very space that pairing depends on as such. We talked also about a pair of hands or a pair of shoes. In each case, the space between the hands or between the shoes is overcome by means of their givenness together. To lose a shoe is to see the inadequacy of the other single one that we have. It is to see shoes as such, as giving perception over from one to the other. Perception in pairing, like a hobbit, makes a trip and comes back all in one moment, in a moment of givenness together. And my hands pair across the space of my body, across the differences in orientation that the left and the right share. Pairing is not an immediate subordination or a fusion. It is an incorporation of distance, of absence, and even of resistance into a whole that moves our consciousness up a notch toward a synthesis that embraces individuals within it as carrying a new or renewed purpose. So when Husserl talks about the example of scissors at the end of section 50, I believe he does more than show that that perceptive transfer happens throughout our conscious life. I believe he means to anticipate the discussion of pairing and implicitly to argue first that we live as co-conspirators in apperceptive transfer of sense to one another, and two, that we also recognize or deploy this transfer in the creation of tools or in the constitution of things. We see or use or build into the world what we are. Or finally, the experience of the structure of our consciousness and our experience of the other person is the motor to all our particular experiences. Because we transfer ourselves as a whole behind our backs to the other person, or rather because she requires this of us, we can transfer our hands to one another, our shoes to each other, and our scissors to each other. We act perceptively transfer because we as a whole consciousness are transferred. The logic of our embodiment, as I've said before, is thus the super erogatory logic of all other logics. Let us turn to section 51, the heart of the meditation, in my opinion, where Husserl discusses pairing most explicitly. Husserl introduces pairing as requiring us to recognize an occurrence and configuration as a pair and then as a group. The distinction and the plurality resides within the unity, and this happens as, quote, a passive synthesis. Something in the ego, then, or something in the ego's embodiment as perceptual consciousness allows it to participate not in self-consciousness, but in activity that remains passive and non-reflective. What I think this means is that we allow what is being prepared to maintain its own directedness, its own occurrence as transcending itself towards something else that claims it, something that to use Husserl's language is, quote, similar to. Pairing is the way that consciousness follows the life of things in their togetherness. And this means that consciousness is always already alive toward, quote, an intentional overreaching coming about genetically. That's at the bottom of 112 to the top of 113. Consciousness perceives genetically a birth of things 
toward each other. Things overreach themselves and each other, and because we have done so with the other person, consciousness is there with them. Let us turn to perhaps the most important page of the fifth meditation, page 113. Here we see Husserl describing pairing as follows. In pairing we see, quote, the living mutual awakening and an overlaying of each with the objective sense of the other. This overlaying can bring a total or a partial coincidence. As the result of this overlaying, there takes place in the paired data a mutual transfer of sense. That is to say, an apperception of each according to the sense of the other. I will try to talk about this quote differently than I have before. Consciousness as life thus perceives living in the things it is toward. It, consciousness, I, perceive the life as an activity of the things that awaken and overlay one another toward a purpose or a meaning, as the blades of the scissors point to a final sense of themselves as a tool for cutting. Consciousness as alive then perceives the life of sense. Meaning is alive and overreaches, jumps from thing to thing in certain pairs, groupings, sets. It is not that we have to see pairing as simply a choice, as if we controlled the pair of birch trees outside my window. Rather, the birch trees call to me and to each other as articulating their milky whiteness against the stand of pines and the brown earth. It is not a comparison that I do. This is white, and so is that, and therefore they're together. But rather, the pairing is accomplished by the trees. And I participate in the birth of the pairing by following them immediately in their trajectory toward each other. Consciousness, at least in the case of pairing men, but also perhaps as such, can be toward the meaningfulness and existence of things because they declare themselves to be toward me and, most importantly, toward one another. And all of these intentional overlays or awakenings point toward my own experience of being overlaid and awakened as a whole consciousness by the other consciousness, <coughs> excuse me, by the other ego. I follow things in their pairing, that is, because I am paired with the other, who has infinitely as much power as I do, and thus prepares me to see the pairs of things, be they trees or shoes or scissors. I have not dealt enough with the notion of mutuality before. In a pairing, the awakening and overlaying is mutual. The transfer of sense is mutual. There is no instigator and no sufferer. There is no dominant and no submissive. Being given together is precisely the expression that mutuality demands. Really, I think that Husserl here has named a kind of perception that is primordial or ordinal in an important way. We see in a pairing a togetherness that does not necessarily disintegrate into competing claims. And that is important for notions of community because contrary to someone like Sartre, for Husserl, we are not condemned to recognize only either myself or the other person as the one who has the whole world in view. If our whole consciousness are, misses are paired, if our bodies are paired, then there is hope for creating community and government that does not rest on the active imposition of power. If our bodies and our perceptions begin in and are capable of mutuality, then we can, we could, create in that image. I think this is big. We perceive the primary phenomena of mutuality, therefore we have the power to create it. I'm reminded here of the book of Ruth, there is a pairing that Ruth performs with her mother-in-law, Naomi. It seems to be a choice of Ruth's at first, but it quickly moves from a choice to a kind of immediate mutuality that has its own life. Quote, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. What fascinates me about this pairing is the way that these women devote their lives to one another. They walked on foot in utter poverty and vulnerability. And I teach this book a lot because I tell the students that these women walked an enormous distance on foot and that had, by doing that, they were completely vulnerable. They went together on foot in the world of hardened men as outsiders, as both young and old. They shared every danger, every grain of wheat gleaned in the field. 
They even shared Ruth's son, as Naomi considered Obed her own. This kind of mutuality, this pairing that carries their names forever together, this kind of mutuality and overlaying seems to carry people toward a notion and an experience of faith and community rooted in some passive synthesis that nevertheless sustains active choice and confirmation. All right, so that's the section on pairing and the super example of scissors. Do you have any questions on, on that section? And there are two left, I think, for those of you who are like, can I please leave now? It's very, you know, it's close to being done. Just so. <laughs> Well, I would like to um, make um, first um, uh, a thank you. I mean, I, I, I enjoyed reading your, um, your prose and your description of this, um, uh, this pairing that, that takes place. It's, it's, more, it's a joyous one, and it's um, uh, a cooperative one, this constituting together, sharing and, um, and, um, and I also appreciate your mention of the Ruth passage. That is my marriage passage, believe it or not. <laughs> and, but I have one question that, um, that, that um, it just strikes me as odd, um, and that maybe you can just touch on briefly. And that is that in all of this shared constitution and this discussion that Husserl and you, and you have, is that language never comes up. And yet, um, it's impossible for me to imagine that any of this shared constitution could take place outside of a shared language. I mean, I, I just, I don't see any disagreement. I actually think you're correct. What I, what I notice is that in the fifth meditation early on, when we try to restrict ourselves to the sphere of ownness, we cannot speak, right? So, so whatever ownness is, when we try to restrict it to just ownness, Husserl says language cannot figure in. And that's one of the reasons I think all he has to work with in onus is the body. So as soon as the other person appears, language is back in. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what is behind your, your comment. I think maybe what you mean is, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, um, how does the in introduction of language shift phenomenology? And I think phenomenology does not have its own language. That is, it cannot purify itself and speak only um, one rigorous and well-defined way, perhaps the way math or physics can. Um, however, for phenomenology, that's part of what I would take the joyous um, multiplicity to be, namely that we have to continuously work to reshape and redescribe and re-examine experience because it is never clear what is influencing what, whether language influences the experience of the thing or the thing calls for the experience of language. And I think that's why continental philosophy in general and phenomenology in particular is often degraded as poetry by um, you know, Anglican philosophy or analytic philosophy, because phenomenology doesn't even try to some extent to get its language right. It rather starts in the middle of things and tries to get people to continuously go back and forth between the thing and consciousness such that we sort of go towards um, experience itself as the validation of its description. So something I tell my students, whether we're talking about Hegel or Husserl or Heidegger or whatever, is that they are talking about experience. If you can't experience the things they're talking about, then they're wrong. If you can, and they need to be described differently, you need to say that so that we can somehow work on the language proper. I will, however, contrary to what I've just said, notice that Husserl's project is often to try to stretch language or re return to things like noesis and noema to get us away from presuppositions of language that has sort of philosophical baggage to it. Heidegger, too, enforces upon the reader a kind of redefinition of language that is appropriate for description. So ultimately, 
language can be an other. I'll just say this and then maybe risk everything, right? That language is in a sense an other just as much as the other person is. And so working with language can at times be um, like struggling to hear a person correctly. Peter, I just want to resonate with getting yourself into trouble. Not that we should take that direction of discourse for a long time now, but uh, Merleau Pansy in, in science, of course, would talk about the personal nature of language and especially poetic language. So, um, yeah, just, just a footnote. Nice. What I wanted to ask you about uh, sexuality and uh, bodily transfer, just a few words maybe, uh, and violence also, if, uh, if you have time. Um, can you repeat that? Because I was, I was... Sexuality and violence. I'm thinking about the public discourse, which is now on everybody's mind. Oh, yes. that, that connects very closely with our discussion. Yes. Um, I mean, it's, it's a national tragedy um, that we are presented with people who describe violence occurring to them who are not believed and who um, are prevented from attesting to those events in their life, which is quite painful. And so like, uh, being a body and being paired with people doesn't mean, doesn't, doesn't help us get to mutuality without work. The fact that we are structured as mutually perceiving within a coordinate system of perception doesn't guarantee that people will be phenomenologically um, honest, nor does it guarantee that we automatically know how to form the community that remains a possibility. That's why for phenomenology, we don't uncover the a priori as evidently constructing for us what has to occur in order for our world to become more and more like our transcendental structure. Rather, the transcendental structure opens into a possibility for us uh, what we could do, but it, it can very easily be shut down. And I think it goes back to how the human body, language, anything can be turned into an object. Um, and so Husserl talks about these sorts of things in the crisis. We are experiencing a crisis of all ways of knowing and all ways of perceiving because we fundamentally do not go back to the experience of the life world and how it implicates us with all other human beings and all other experiences. And so when we don't do that, we, we suppress meaning as such and we don't know what the end of that will be. So like, like we're suppressing the information coming from these abused people. Um, question, uh, what's your plan with the rest of the lecture? Do we still have uh, sections to go? We have uh, two sections to go. I'm on page 15 of a single spaced paper that goes to the bottom of sec page 22. So I'm okay. happy to continue, but I don't want to, you know, keep people here who need to go eat or use the bathroom or do whatever they want to do. Like, you, you're not beholden to me, so. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the time. Uh, it's 15 minutes left, and I'm thinking that we should not jam your lecture. Okay. We can either continue and try to cover the remainder of the lecture now, or, or we can uh, transfer it to another um, uh, time uh, and, and meet once again after we do a little bit of reading and digesting. And then of course, uh, we'll, we'll adjust our agreement um, in terms of, you know, everything. Um, you know, I, I think we could get through one more section in 15 minutes and I'm willing to stay another 10 or 15 to talk. Oh, you can, you. right? Okay. I, I just have to get our daughter off of the bus, probably around 2.20. Um, okay, okay. So, so that's, yeah, that, that was my concern, exactly. So then uh, time is yours and please just navigate as you, as you feel like. All right, and, and if we don't have time for as many questions as people have, perhaps we could email or be in contact with one another in another way. 
but I do very much appreciate all of your attendance and, and uh, interest. In the next few sections, this is 52 to 54, Husserl writes more about how this pairing and givenness together with the other person could come about. He is identifying the sources, in other words, in our intentional life that are called upon in the event of perception of pairing. This question, how is it possible, is the taking up of the initial thought experiment of the reduction of the sphere of ownness and giving it real phenomenological value. What are our own self experiences that contribute to the experience of pairing. In section 52, Husserl is careful to ask after the way that the experience of the alien other person gets verified. And the answer, the verification, the ongoing certainty of experience comes from the way, as Husserl says on page 114, that the co-perceptions or apresentations of the other person's otherness and acts of perceiving, quote, owe their existence value to their motivational connection with the changing perceptions proper within my ownness that continually appertain to them. I would read this sentence in this way. The other person exists for me. She transcends me in a way that is meaningful because her existence remains connected within my ownness. She remains connected because her system of perceivings, her world always appertains to mine. The other remains in my consciousness instead of exploding it, in other words, because every act of being other is something that matters to me. When she leaves me behind, I cry or laugh. When she approaches me, I wince or smile. The other, in other words, is never someone with whom I have nothing to do. For as soon as I experience her alterity, I experience also the internal connections she bears to my own life. This is not Husserl being dogmatic, but descriptive. It may well be that I do not perceive the other as other, and surely these hearings show people unwilling to experience the other. So this perception is perhaps dormant in my life with respect to any number of people on the earth. And yet as soon as I do perceive their alterity, I am claimed internally by the links that bring me to them. What are these links? Husserl offers the other's harmonious behavior that I can nevertheless not verify. The other appears to me as the one who can understand Husserl easily and write easily about. This is something that, like, nightmares for me. Just kidding. And yet I cannot for the life of me figure out how to do what he or she does. Their otherness claims me, for example, in frustration or irritation or jealousy. Her behavior is related to mine, but is not mine. And that gap between her behavior flowing out of a central organization and my behavior, between her center and my inability to live a seemingly familiar pattern from within my own, that gap is the life of otherness as such, the space or silence between the notes of a song. It is not only my center that the other person engages. He engages my time as well. Husserl talks on page 115 about, quote, an instructive comparison. And he mentions the way in which my past and present and future transcend one another, the way I overlay the past and my past ego in, a, in an act of remembering. It is worth taking note of the point in full, page 115. Just as in my living present, in the domain of internal perception, my past becomes constituted by virtue of the harmonious memories occurring in the present, so in my primordial sphere, an ego other than mine can become constituted. What Husserl is not saying is just as important as what he is saying. He is not saying that my internal time is what I draw on all by myself to imagine or experience the other. It is not because I have time that I have an other. Rather, what he is saying is that time, as a motion of self-alienation, by which I leave my present in order to remember my past, that my time is something that resonates with the experience of the other. Harmony allows for my past to remain present and for me to dwell in it. I have systems of behavior within myself that are given together by means of my connection to them internally. But my inner time, my past behavior, or my habits that I display automatically in the present, this is simply what gets activated or called up by the other person. My own time, my own behavior is not sufficient to grasp her. Rather, my habit life, my past, my memory, these are called up as participants in a larger project. Husserl is careful to say right there that the other person involves, quote, non-originary presentations of a new type, 
which have a modification of a new kind as their correlate. Time, my time, then gets engaged by the other, but not by itself. The other is not a piece of my time. She is her own temporality too. And this is why I think Husserl moves quickly on from time back to the body in section 53. There, Husserl supplements his discussion of behavior in time with that of embodiment. The other lives a here that is my there. I cannot convert that here into my own here, since he or she escapes me each time I approach. But nevertheless, the other person maintains her position relative to mine on the same spatial field. The fact that she resists my conversion of her to my noema only serves to stimulate my attention, perception, desire. And thus her or his a priori resistance contributes a good degree of energy to the possibility of being to get given together in understanding and mutuality. Let's turn to page 117. Quote, in this appresentation, therefore, the body and the mode there, which presents itself in my monadic sphere and is apperceived as another's lived body, that body indicates the same body in the mode here as the body experienced by the other ego in his monadic sphere. There is a duality of reference then that draws upon my own sense of space and its convertibility by my motion. The other's here is for me a there and simultaneously so. She is a there in a new way, a body in a new way that still claims me within a shared space. She does not stop being a here, even though to me she is there in my coordinates. And it is this inconvertibility that causes me to take a stand on her through friendship, enmity, or indifference. I cannot but take a stand on her spatiality, given that she is given to me as within my spatial system and outside of it at the same time. So anything that's given within and outside at the same time, I have to take a stand on. Thus, Husserl has covered the possibility and the manner or the how of the experience of the other as rooted in our action, our time, and our space. If the behavior of the other implicates and calls to us, that is because our time and our motion are called forward to meet her. But neither my time nor my space is sufficient on its own to explain this completely. And hence we are carried towards section 54. For it is here that the second most important point in the first meditation is launched, namely the way in which the totality of my body and the subjunctive character of our pairing are called forward toward the other and toward myself. Let us let's turn to 54. It's here that Husserl explicitly maintains that my whole body, my whole consciousness, is pulled into the passive synthesis, the transfer, the pairing with the other. And to skip a bit, from this fact of the whole of me being pulled into pairing, the world as such becomes a possible object of my consciousness as an infinitely unfolding meaning. Osiro puts it this way at the top of page 118. The other person's appearance, quote, awakens reproductively another, an immediately similar appearance included in the system constitutive of my animate organism as a body in space. It brings to mind the way my body would look like if I were there. The first awakened manner of appearance of my body is not the only thing that enters into a pairing. My body itself does so likewise as the synthetic unity pertaining to this mode of its appearance. There are two important points to this passage. First, the appearance of the other person is itself a pairing of her body and my own. She is never there for me as simply herself. She certainly is herself, but she is also experienced by me at the same time as a variation of me, albeit with a gap. She is the way I would be if I were her, over there, with a different orientation, race, gender, age, etc. She claims me so totally that she is not simply a basic material appearance of a body as such, whatever that would be, an abstraction from specificity, but rather she appears as the body as a whole, as a synthetic unity. She appears as a body that is itself act. And as act, she appears with me as act. Pairing is thus a shared act of being a body. This fact, namely that the whole of my body's active unity appears to me as paired with her body there, is what explains my ability to pair with such differently embodied people. I can pair with a black Jewish woman 
or a gay Middle Eastern man just as surely as I can with a white Catholic middle-aged Irishman. And that is because everything I am as a body includes the manner in which I live any specificity that appears to me. The pairing with the other person then is a pairing with the way we each live our here, with the stances we take on what De Beauvoir calls and other people call facticity. It is the wholeness of our bodies that pair so that we can take account of the ways that we do not pair within that. Thus do I understand that we are, as Hustrell says toward the bottom of page 18, and quote, overlapping at a distance, which occurs by virtue of associative pairing, which is still at the same time a fusion. That is to say, it is because you claim me as a whole style of living that I can come to care about the way that there is a distance, a difference between us. As Husserl remarks on page 119, the mystery of the pairing association we enact with the other person in a kind of mutual transfer, in a passive synthesis, is what makes possible the fact, quote, that which is primordially incompatible in simultaneous coexistence becomes compatible. I am paired as a whole that has gaps within it by virtue of our ownness, not despite it. And thus you could never see who I am from the inside, but rather from within your striving, your desire, your promise, that you would, if you ever could, get here to my here from where you are. This subjunctive, this I would get there if I could, if I were there, is a very thin gap. It is thinner than a moment of time, since the subjunctive is neither the thickness of the present nor the, the thickness of the future. The subjunctive is also a very strong force. It is stronger than a moment, since it carries the past within it as it surges toward the present and future without ever becoming them. Basically, and this goes some way to talking about language, right? That there is something subjunctive in us. Basically, ownness as a layer of experience exists in the act of pairing as a movement toward. And you know, everyone who writes phenomenology talks about towards, towards a phenomenology of this or being toward that. Right? We are in the act of pairing as a movement toward and therefore within the other person and the object of intentionality. Another way of saying this, insofar as my ownness is paired with the other person's ownness, insofar as their here is a there that I would convert to a here if I could, then I recognize that what and who I am is a breaking open toward the object. My ego and my consciousness, even in ownness, is never self-enclosed. It is always ownness on the way towards others, an ownness always on the cusp of expanding to recognize that it exists only as a subjunctive desire to convert the totality of my body and my experience of space into a shared adequate description of another person and of a world. So I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna take a break. I'm gonna go right through section 55 and 56 and then I will stay for as many questions as I can. I hope that's okay, but even if it's not, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so, um, so what we see is like three pages left that are single spaced. What we see in section 55 is the way that pairing immediately opens us onto a world. This happens in two steps. The first way is in the fact that pairing immediately opens into a world of embodiment as such. On page 120, Husserl speaks in this way, quote, the first thing constituted in the form of community and the foundation for all other intersubjectively common things is the commonness of nature, along with that of the other's organism and his psychophysical ego as paired with my own psychophysical ego. Embodiment then is the form of community. It is not a divisive force or it need not be. And it is because of our shared embodiment, our shared way of living a total body that we can come to grasp everything else that's shared as accruing a shared meaning that requires that we talk, describe and recognize all that which refers to all of us. And this communal embodiment becomes a world by means of what Husserl describes as, quote, the functional community of one perception. It's on page 122. We may perceive different profiles of an object, different sides, but we are guaranteed 
to be perceiving the same thing. And we are guaranteed of the process of coming to grips together with the process of the whole meaning of that thing because we perceive together what it means to be a living body in the structure that we are. We function as organs of a whole, a whole of embodiment that is ours together and yet still individually our own. And what we perceive as such organs overlaps and awakens each other. As lived bodies, we realize ourselves as being toward an ideal, adequate account of the thing or of the world that will never be fulfilled, but will always remain in process. The logic is this. We pair together and realize that our whole bodies are paired together. Because of this, we are given a world that we both perceive. But by being given a world, we find that nothing within that world is ever fully convertible by either of us into a simple statement of our own constitution. No noema, no explication ever fully relinquishes transcendence to us. We deploy our own subjunctivity then in terms of each other in our relationship with things and the world. And thus do we find that things have always already gained a kind of alterity from our own alterity relative to one another as subjects within a functional community of perception. The thing's transcendence, it's more that I would see if I were there where you are. This gains strength from our subjunctivity relative to one another. I will never simply see the thing as you do. I will never speak about it as you do. Therefore, I will never see it from all sides. And thus the givenness of the thing as such through the profiles is the echo and the distance of our pairing. The thing is given as a whole, but inadequately, because the thing is the expression of how the world, as it appears to you, will be forever of interest, often urgently, to me. The second related way that pairing opens onto a world is through the expression and the expansion of the experience of time. The second expansion of pairing is only hinted at towards the end of section 55. There on page 128, Husserl speaks of the way that our embodiment as shared is, quote, spreading out from there by its identifying synthesis of the same nature, given and verified primordially. In other words, pairing is not just a static occurrence of material embodiment as a momentary event. Pairing is a pairing of intentional life that unfolds together as a pursuit of meaning. Everything in phenomenology is a pursuit of meaning. And when we share a functional community of perception, what we also share is the being tossed into the world of that perception that requires that we navigate each other's place repeatedly. The pairing of our bodies then requires and is always open to the pairing of our egos, and as such is always requiring the pairing of our temporalities. Husserl makes this point in a rather long final passage of section 55 on page 128. Let's consider it in its totality. Quote, in that way, in the way of pairing, the coexistence of my polar ego and the other ego, of my whole concrete ego and his, my intentional life and his, my realities and his. In short, a common time form is primarily instituted, and thus every primordial temporality automatically acquires the significance of being merely an original mode of appearance of objective temporality to a particular subject. In this connection, we see that the temporal community of the constitutively interrelated monads is indissoluble because it is tied up essentially with the constitution of a world and a world time. To pair with the other's body is to feel my time called upon and shifted from within. It is no longer simply my time, but ours. And the world is now temporally and not just bodily communal. We form a relationship, we are called, and our time is no longer our own. Anyone who has ever cared for anyone else, whether a parent or a child or a lover or an anonymous person in a hospital or a soup kitchen, anybody who has cared about anybody has learned this with various emotional colorings. You are now paired with me in a lecture in which your time is no longer your own, and you may feel right now worried about that very fact and wondering if you can push the button on the computer that ends this community that I have imposed upon you. But what this means is that the having of a world is not separate from pairing. It is pairing. To pair is to have a world and a time that both roots itself in our ownness spheres and transcends them at the same time. 
to pair is to enact our ecstatic selves as intentional and to push ourselves into community as that which our consciousness is made for. We must experience community, and we do, because our bodies are not simply made to be our own. We must experience world, and we do, because the horizon of our objects is the very expression of our sharing ourselves and our perceptual systems. Neither the world nor our functional community of perception exist before the other. So Bill, this is where I think sociality does not pre-exist world or experience. Rather, the having of a world is the upsurge of our pairing, of our perceiving the other person, the alien, as the functionally and primordially first other. To perceive the other is to perceive the world. World is not therefore a thing. It is the unfolding of the action of shared perception into a horizon of meaning that condenses itself into objects to pursue. This is Bill Powers. This is my answer to you. The world condenses itself into objects. Having shown in section 55 how the community we bear in our pairing opens onto a community of embodiment and of time, Husserl then in section 56 moves on to talk more about community. And it is here that I would like to end our discussion today. Because openness is, ownness is not simply erased, it's not an experiment only, we remain separated in our communion. We remain selves and not fused organs of a common super being. Nevertheless, as Tustrel says, communal perception, a communal having of a body and a time, this community is not nothing. Rather, he says on page 129, quote, something that exists is an intentional community with something else that exists. It is an essentially unique connectedness, an actual community, and precisely the one that makes transcendentally possible the being of a world, a world of people and things. If Edith Stein has said that empathy is perception sui generis, and she has said that, that's in line with this statement of Husserl. Our pairing with one another is unique and ensures that the other person exists. Her existence then never fell, the other's existence, never fell under the transcendental reduction, never really was reduced by the reduction to the sphere of ownness. Ownness on its own, so to speak, transcended itself toward the other from within, from within the experience of the other that I have or can have at any time, whether I choose or not when her alterity shows through. This being together means that the world is always already possible. It is a transcendental achievement by virtue of our always already being paired. We are scissors together that cut through the world and select things to be worked on. We are shoes that walk together on the path to Judah. And we are so actually and existentially. Husserl does not offer a proof or even a conclusion. He offers experience that generates every further move in phenomenology in a discovery of essential meanings with specific existential colorings. What we have then, given our functional community of perception, our common time, our world, is the possibility to make explicit our, quote, implicit mutual being for one another. I recently showed clips of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation to a class studying nationalism. And I asked them why the film had that title. One particularly good student said that she thought that we tended to lose our way as a nation, to forget our origins, and that the film showed something about how that forgetfulness would continue until we took the origins of democracy seriously. I think that what she means is that our mutual being for one another in any community, and as such, that is transcendentally, has to be made explicit. It remains always implicit, at least in part, and takes real shared work to bring it to the fore. We may be given together, but our shared givenness, our community, gets its own ownness by virtue of explication, just like our own personal ownness does. No one is saved by pairing, but no one is ever completely lost either because of it. Pairing is the experience, the phenomenon by which Zacchaeus can be called from the tree by Jesus by which Moses descending the mountain may remind the faithful Jews by his face of the meeting with God. Pairing is the calling toward phenomenology 
as the making explicit of mutuality, internality, the one within the other. Pairing, I dare say, is the call of democracy and faith. It is the recognition, as Husserl says at the end of section 56, that, quote, for each man, every other is implicit in this horizon, physically, psychophysically, in respect of what is internal to the other's psyche, and is thus in principle the realm of endless accessibilities, though in fact most other people remain horizontal. Pairing is the call to others and still more others. It is the desire, the striving toward more explicit forms of mutuality that can open onto the promise God gave to Abraham. We are the stars in the sky, and our journey is just beginning. To get there, we must take meaning seriously as an adventure of shared bodily life in a world of mutual implication. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you might have. I can't hear. Thank you so much, Peter. This was just fantastic. I hope you like it. What I would like to do, though, now, I will stop the recording. Uh, So so I I, I think it's... uh, Do do we need the rest of the questions on the tape? Um, No. no. I I don't think so. I'll stop the recording also because I will be kicked out of the classroom, literally, in two minutes. That may take me offline, but the, 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 the gathering will continue. And if I'm offline, then I will ask either you, can, can you take on the, um, completely the leading function, not just as a speaker, but as a leader for the webinar, or should I ask somebody about, uh, among the... Well, actually, in about five minutes, I'm going to have to go to, to get my daughter. So maybe what we can yourself. do... Just take a couple of questions and then people can email me or email you and you can tell we will me. we will have to be online to decide on the next step anyway because we don't have time to discuss it now so let's say one most crucial question and okay. th- then we wrap it up and then we'll proceed online and take take it from there all right sounds good yeah. okay and i will make your recording available to everybody on this group editing because people may want to re-listen and send questions etc so one one thank you so much one closing question i'm sure people will be also saying thanks okay Okay, please no pressure but who wants the last question (laughs) well i have a question as always (laughs) Um, i'm going to take up this this um uh, um how do you want to call it this is discussion about pairing and um you have this discussion